uh, sorry, it's a little bit difficult because one thing that I do get asked sometimes from parents is, you know, what should I say? What are the words? And that's very difficult because I, there are no perfect words. Um, <laughs> I, I've never found them anyway right. uh, to tell kids about something difficult or something awkward or, or something that is changing in their lives. Um, but there are some rules of thumb. <laughs> Access to Justice. I am your host, Evan Clark from Kahane Law, here with my co host, as usual, Heather Malarek from Merrick Law. Heather, good morning. Morning, Evan. How are you enjoying this lovely April day? Oh, it's just so nice to see the sun shining. The magpies are building a nest outside of my window. It's going to be a nice, noisy summer. How are you doing? That's great. And magpies, they like shiny things, right? So you know, if you start missing jewelry, Great. Just look out in the nest. <laughs> it's probably not the children. It's probably the magpies. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I know by the time people are watching this, it won't be uh, April anymore, but um, I just, the, one of the nicest things about our long winters here in Edmonton is when they end. Mm. It's like, you feel so happy. Oh, the sun. And it's like, I can go outside without wearing a parka. And it, it, it's such a lift. You don't get that lift when you live in Arizona. It's like, oh, it's, it's warm. It remains warm and sunny today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's true. Uh, and of course, as usual, our special guest, Kim McDonald from Kim, where are you from? I am a financial advisor with McDonald Advisory, and the firm I work with is Raymond James. So thank you for having me, Evan. I love participating on your panel and certainly excited about uh, our guest today. Yeah, me too. Uh, Heather, introduce our guest. Yeah, without further ado, I'm very excited to have Brandy Smith joining us today. Um, Brandy and I and Kim are all collaborative, registered collaborative professionals. And um, every time Brandy and I seem to get somewhere together, I just want to pick her brain for such a long time and I'd ask her so many questions. So I'm really excited to have her here and get an opportunity to do that. Brandy is a registered psychologist who's been working um, as a psychologist for 11 years uh, in Alberta. She's got her master's degree in counseling psychology and works with the wonderful gang over at Creating Solutions. Um, she works with all sorts of clients, including children, youth, adults, and families, um, and has a particular niche in working with families that are going through separation and divorce. Um, she says her primary focus is on healthy children and healthy family systems, regardless of the current level of conflict. So I'm so excited to have her here today and, um, and to ask her some questions. Hi, Brandy, how are you? Good, good, thanks for having me today. Thanks for coming. Um, did I miss anything in the bio? Is there anything else you want our listeners to know about you? Mm, not so much. I think, I think that's a good snapshot of kind of like where things are at right now. Um, uh, definitely, uh, prior to being a psychologist, uh, worked with children and families, um, in a couple different arenas. Um, I've worked in child and family services. I've worked in the healthcare system, uh, and whatnot, and always had kind of a little bit of a foot in my, uh, in a private practice. So it was kind of nice. Um, I believe it was about eight eight years ago or so, um, made the leap to do full-time private practice. And that's just been, been lovely. So I can kind of design my caseload the way that I like it. So I have a nice, a nice balance. Um, I think general practice that, uh, that I really enjoy, um, mostly focused on children, but of course, uh, you know, with private practice, you kind of take what comes through the door. So that's been really interesting for me. So, Brandy, Heather said you help families and children no matter the level of conflict. So does that include no conflict? 
Yes, actually, surprisingly enough, it absolutely does. Um, those are sometimes some of my favorite clients. Um, so I do actually get um, uh, various parents coming in when they're um, before they've actually either legally or physically separated, and they're just coming in for information. Um, so it's kind of a little bit more uh, consultative rather than you know intervention uh, kind of based. Um, but absolutely, it's lovely to sit there and talk with parents who are um, at the beginning stages and just kind of wanting to do the best uh, that they can and um, understand their children's development level uh, in order to make good choices. So yeah, I, I surprisingly get to people with zero conflict. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it's just important to note because um, <clears throat> I think a lot of times if people engaged with somebody like you uh, years or months before they come and see somebody like me, they might never have to meet me in my <laughs> professional capacity as a family lawyer. Uh -huh. Yeah, sometimes sometimes that is the case, right? It's it's uh, that old phrase, you know, an ounce of prevention is sometimes worth uh, more than a pound of cure, um, and and absolutely that's something that I find. Uh, there's um, some really wonderful research in all sorts of areas of, of psychology about um, the need for early intervention and early understanding, um, you know, information essentially to uh, to be able to. Um, essentially change the trajectory that could possibly go um, before patterns start to become really rigid in a, in a family system. So um, yeah, it's, it's always great to be able to provide information that way or, or to provide um, uh, kind of that first initial contact. So I guess what I'm hearing there, Brandy, is it's never too soon to get uh, someone involved with the family, if even if you're just contemplating a divorce or separation. So you could so help support them right from the very beginning. Um, is there kind of a perfect time? Like, is that too soon for people to be doing that? Or is there a good time for you to get involved on a more formal basis? Um, I don't think if there's there's necessarily a perfect time to be uh -huh. contacted. Um, it's just essentially depending on when somebody is contacting me, um, either my response or the type of services will probably change, right? Okay. If if I have uh, two parents coming in, so the, the no conflict example, if I have two parents coming into my office and they're saying, you know, um, it looks like our marriage is going to be dissolving, uh, we have, you know, two children, these are their ages, we want to know how to introduce this to them, what kinds of things we have to be aware of, you know, the timing of um, when we're going to tell them, languaging around what we're going to say, you know, like what can we do? That obviously I'm or not, I guess not obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, but um, typically what would happen is I would just simply have a conversation, the type of services that they're going to get um, are going to match what their need is at the time. So I'm probably going to have them, you know, uh, read some resources. I'm going to provide uh, probably websites or, you know, books, that kind of thing um, that will help them um, what they know, what they need to know. Um, and then usually I say, like, you know, my door is open. And if anything changes in the future, if you have more questions in the future, please do let me know. Um, and, uh, and we'll go from there. If families are coming in and they say, you know, we have separated um, already, uh, this is what it has looked like to date, um, I think our children are doing okay, however, we want to just kind of make sure. Um, at that point, um, you know, we talk to them about what the different options are, may or may not meet with the kids just to kind of gather what they um, have to say, what their perspectives are, you know, that kind of thing, and give, again, some feedback to the parents. And if you kind of go keep going along the continuum, um, sometimes, you know, uh, we have separated and, you know, our son or daughter is uh, seeming to be struggling. Uh, we've gotten some feedback from the teachers at school or whichever. Then that's going to look really different. I might work individually with that child. I might uh, work with the family as a whole, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and then if you keep moving along the continuum, mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, there has been, you know, conflict um, or 
or the children have been under distress or, or feeling anxious or, or, or having difficulties with change um, for a period of time. And the parents can't quite see eye to eye on what their origins are, what they should be doing about it. Um, that's when my role gets a little bit more formalized. Uh, it might involve, um, you know, court orders or, you know, um, orders from justices in regards to kind of what exactly the role needs to be and how decisions are going to be made, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it really is like the, it runs the whole gamut. So it's, it's not that there's a perfect time to come. Although I'm highly biased, of course, I'm going to say uh, the earlier, the better. Um, but it's really just meeting the family where they're at. Um, if, uh, if things are more intensive, meeting mm -hmm. them with more intensive services. And if things are less intensive, um, meeting them there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I um, often get the comments or sort of the feedback. People are pretty overwhelmed, it seems to me, often when they're, you know, contemplating uh, separation or going through it. Um, and they also have sort of additional time responsibilities, stresses, money. So, um, you know, if, if I'm talking to a parent or a parent is listening to this, is there anything that you would recommend that they be sort of either watching for in themselves or in their kids that would be a bit of a marker of like, you know, if you're thinking about <laughs> seeing a psychologist, but you're not sure, these are the things that you want to be maybe watching for. And that would be a reason to, to definitely reach out. Like I hear you saying, like, I think every family can, <laughs> can probably benefit from your help. But are, are there any things that are really like sort of flags that, um, that they should pick up the phone and call someone? Yeah. Um, and these would be flags um, that would be for other types of um, concerns or issues as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Meaning that, um, you know, uh, with people, if there is a change um, and there's kind of um almost like a reverb, reverb effect or uh, changes within the individual that are drastic in either direction, um, those are usually good cues. So, okay. for example, if you're looking, um, if you're you know, a parent and, you know, uh, there's been some sort of a change in your family's life and then you're noticing your child is eating differently, sleeping differently, having a difficult time regulating their emotions. Um, so they tend to react even more so than, than what would be typical. Um, if they're struggling or having uh, kind of any kind of altercations or conflict with their peers at school um, or peers of friends within the community, um, those are typically the signs that we would show is that, that they have some underlying stress that just is, is either overwhelming the system or they're not able to kind of manage so that they're, um, they're not able to manage the rest of their day to day. Uh, I don't know if listeners are uh, familiar with the, the term fight or flight. Uh, but essentially, those are all indications that um, a fight or flight response, a stress related response is going on within an individual. Uh, and for parents, it's, you know, we're all human. So it's relatively the same. You know, uh -huh. I would I would ask, you know, um, are you feeling overwhelmed? Are you able to think clearly and problem solve effectively? Are you able to manage your own emotions and, um, you know, not kind of have them uh, overwhelm your day-to-day -day or overwhelm your your kind of self-perception. Um, how's your eating? How's your sleeping? Um, all of those good basics that, that are good indicators that mm. something might not be quite managed well. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Uh, um, one thing that I hear, that I, I certainly hear a lot from clients, um, I like, I don't know what kind of input you can provide about this, Brandy, is... Um, you hear something like, oh, whenever the child comes back from dad's house or the other parent's house, then um, it takes them like a day or two to, to calm down. And this is often related to saying um, they shouldn't be spending so much time with that parent. And that parent is, you know, a bad parent. Well, maybe not a bad parent, but the, there's something's not right about their parenting. Um, and then of course, you know what the other party says? 
the exact same it's thing. Not me, it's them. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, do you hear that as well? And and uh, I don't know what kind of input do you have on on that kind of a situation? Yeah, that's that is actually a really common uh, a common occurrence, um, and there's a couple different things that kind of go on with that. Um, one of the things. <laughs> Uh, and I kind of mentioned at the beginning, I can talk about psychology s for so long. Uh, there's these two concepts in psychology, um, uh, correlation and um, uh, causation. And um, what ends up happening is because parents obviously are heavily invested in their children, they want to know what's going on. Uh, if there's any concerns, they want to be able to fix those concerns and they want happy and healthy children. I mean, that is the one constant, no matter which parents I'm talking to, um, that's always the constant. Parents want their kids to be happy and healthy in life and, and be doing well. And so what ends up happening is the brain will mistake what is uh, we say correlation, that these two things are related in some capacity to a causation. This thing has caused this other thing to happen. Um, and it's, it's very easy to do. Um, everybody does it in different scenarios for different reasons. Um, but what can happen is it can lead down that path where you're um, identifying a certain concern or an issue that that may actually be not the the root or not the cause. Um, so correlation, two things are related, uh, and then causation, one thing creates the other thing or, or kind of determines the other thing. Um, so essentially, is that it is very. In a, in a nutshell, it is very common um, for children to struggle with transitioning between two houses. Um, I would uh, be hard pressed to find a child who doesn't struggle at all. Um, so typically what it is, is that we're talking more so about the degree of which a child struggles to go back and forth, because anytime we have change in our life, it creates a small amount of stress. Right. And and um, I don't know if anybody, uh, you know, out there listening today or um, either the three of you can think about, you know, how you start your day, depending on whether how routine it is versus how different or um, unexpected things happen in there, it will throw us off, right? We'll start to feel a bit, a little bit disjointed or disorganized, or, you know, we might actually have, um, you know, irritation and frustration. Those are all stress signs. And so even just getting up in the morning, putting on the appropriate clothes and getting, well, in front of your computer as we are today um, is stressful. Uh, to some degree. It's just usually we've got enough of a rhythm that we don't notice the stress. Um, but for children going between two homes, um, depending on the um, uh, the consistency between two homes versus how different those two homes are, uh, depending on the relationship between all the different family members, uh, depending on their own internal ability to adjust um, these sometimes can unfortunately just um, pile up and compound upon each other. And so you will have, you know, some children who going back and forth uh, between two houses is difficult. And so um, what I would encourage parents listening today, if they're thinking, oh, that sounds like my child, um, instead of focusing on what the other parent may be doing or not doing, um, to really instead focus on what could help their child with that transition. Because um, rarely is it, um, causational, where it is simply due to the fact that this other parent is doing something or not doing something. Um, usually there are a variety of reasons and there are things that can be done, whether that's, you know, um, helping the child uh, practice calming exercises, whether that's validating the difficulty, validating the stress, um, you know, planning something uh, interesting or even low key for when they come back to your home. All of these little things can kind of help children um, go through that process and, and make that easier for them. What kind of effect does conflict uh, have, conflict between the parents 
have on on that phenomenon or of that stress level of the child when they're going back between house to house. And I guess what I mean is um, what this can sometimes spawn if the parents aren't careful. I don't know of any parent um, that really wants to uh, put their child in the crossfire. I, I don't think that's very common. I think more commonly they may not quite realize that they're putting the child in the, in the crossfire. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, if they are making comments about this, that the child might overhear about like, you know, this transition, how difficult it is and putting the blame on the other parent, does that improve things? <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to chuckle at that, but um, uh, not typically, mm -hmm. not typically. Now, granted, you know, when you talk about people and you talk about, um, you know, um, interactions, um, there are no hard and fast rules, but I would be hard pressed to find some, some family that that has actually improved things because uh, children are naturally tuned in to their parents' emotions. Um, that's something that is innate within, um, within humans. Um, there's, there's lots of lovely studies um, that look at the attachment between caregivers and infants, uh, attunement styles, which just means uh, that ability for a parent and, or like a caregiver, pardon me, and an infant to um, kind of mirror each other um, with their, um, with their verbalizations as well as with their emotional expressions. And we have that from the time that we're born. And so kids get really, really good, really, really fast um, reading their parents. Um, and, if, and if anybody ever thinks about, uh, you know, when they were young, um, it's, it can be really quick to know oh, my mom is thinking this, or oh, my dad is feeling this, right? I think we all have stories of things that our parents have done or times when we knew, you know, trouble was coming because we did something and we got a certain look or a certain sigh and um, we knew that we had gone too far. Um, that's what kids do. And so they're constantly going to be reading that. Um, and typically kids um, are incredibly empathetic and um, they love their parents just as much uh, as their parents love them. So they try to um, make things better, right? Um, and this is something that, that I do see come up a lot in my caseload where um, you have a child essentially either uh, changing their behavior to try to make their parents feel better or what they think will make their parents feel better. Um, or you get sometimes questions that the children are asking that are not necessarily appropriate uh, conversations to have with them. Um, or absolutely like your example, you get a lot of really keen ears that are just around corners um, that parents maybe think that, oh, you know, they're playing video games or they're in their room or, you know, they're out in the backyard, um, but kids are, you know, kind of eyes and ears everywhere in the house. So yes, parents do need to be very cautious and very careful, uh, especially with information that is of an adult nature. Um, there is this um, uh, concept or there's this term in uh, family systems and family systems theory that talks about uh, the intergenerational boundary that occurs between parents and children in a family system. And it's, um, you know, kind of like this invisible or, or like, you know, line between the two generations. Um, and that line, especially when children are younger, uh, tends to be a little bit more solid, a little bit more uh, firm. And as kids, kids get older, it can start to be a little bit more diffuse. Um, you know, you tend to share more information or more complex information with, say, teenagers uh, versus uh, children who are school aged. But there are certain topics and certain uh, pieces of information that do always need to stay above that generational or intergenerational boundary. And those would be exactly kind of what you mentioned, right? Um, one parent's thought on another parent's parenting style uh, and or, you know, that other parent as a person or situations that um, are definitely adult oriented, 
orientated, I'm not too sure if that's the word, um, such as, you know, um, court orders, um, lawyers meetings, mm. judges meetings, all of those things um, really are for adults uh, ears and eyes only. And it really doesn't matter how old the child is, um, should not be shared with or questioned or, or talked about with, with children because that just essentially bumps them above that intergenerational boundary and creates a considerable amount of stress and anxiety for them. Yeah, that was, that was my follow-up based on what you're saying is, okay, what happens if... <laughs> If you if you do bump them up above there, and I mean, I think what a situation that where this might commonly happen is, um, you know, saying disparaging remarks about the other parent or parenting skills in front of the child or that the child hears. And I, what you said, I think, is so important too that you don't know they like oh they're playing video games they're not paying attention well. You know, I don't know how much the brain's actually active while they're playing video games. I feel like it's more in a vegetative state <laughs> and uh, they may be able to hear more than we think. So um, that, you know, suggests we need to be very careful as parents what we say around the house. But to the question, it, what does it, what can it, how can it affect the child, um, them hearing one parent say negative things about another parent? Yeah. Um, and there's actually, there's a really great, uh, what we call longitud longitudinal study in regards to this, um, which just means a study that they did over an incredibly long period of time um, called the ACEs study. I don't know if um, people listening are familiar, if the three of you are familiar, um, but ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And so they did this study over many decades um, about different adverse child experiences. Um, which include things like conflict, uh, which include things like um, uh, any kind of abuse, uh, include things like trans, what we could typically would call transiency or um, kind of instability of, uh, of being able to be in one home at one time. People are, are moving in and out of that home or, or, or homes are being uh, left uh, at a regular interval. Uh, all of those things are what we call adverse childhood experiences. And so they were able to identify um, over a child's lifetime what kinds of impacts various adverse uh, childhood experiences have uh, and especially the more adverse childhood experiences that you have. So there's um, I believe 10 to 11 questions or 10 to 11 things that can be identified with um, uh, that questionnaire um, and they did absolutely notice that if people had one or two experiences through their childhood years that they um, were at an increased risk um, uh, for certain, but if they started to have three to five to six of adverse childhood experiences, then that risk level um, dramatically increased. Um, so the things that were affected were were actually amazingly profound. Um, it, it affected all sorts of areas of the children's lives going into adulthood, um, their ability to have healthy relationships, um, whether or not they would finish uh, certain levels of education, including high school or post-secondary, whether they um, um, would potentially have risks of struggling with any substances or al uh, alcohol use, um, as well as just physical um, components. One of the things that sometimes people tend to forget is that stress um, is exhibited physically in our bodies. And so people who had more, um, more amounts of um, adverse childhood experiences also tended to have hypertension, uh, cholesterol issues, and they've actually linked um, those early experiences sometimes with premature uh, death. Um, so people didn't tend to live as long as their counterparts without those risks. Um, there is actually a really wonderful resource um, called the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative. I hope I said that right. Um, they have a wonderful website that actually has really great um, pieces of information as little videos, um, just talking about how brains are built and the impact of stress on those brains, as well as something that is being talked more and more about, um, which is called toxic stress. Um, and toxic stress is something that is, um, it's essentially stress situations that are too far 
more out of a child's um, level of control and ability to manage. So something that is going on in the environment around them that they can't necessarily change, like um, separation and divorce. Um, and if there is a lot of conflict related to that, how that kind of overwhelms their system over a long period of time and what that can actually do, um, which is essentially the, the basis of that, that ACEs study as well. So, so um, that's one of those things, right? Going back to that phrase, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure is, you know, if you can, um, if somebody is going through a separation and divorce, if you can work on um, healthy patterns, uh, healthy decisions, uh, coping strategies, both for yourself and for your kids um, from the start, then, then typically those things are well managed, and it becomes something that um, that does not have a long term negative effect on the children. Parents do a lot about how to tell their kids that life is going to be changing. So separation is happening, divorce is happening. I think a lot of parents have different ways of communicating this information to kids, and maybe it's a there's an age appropriateness to how you have those discussions. Are there, do you have any thoughts on how to tell kids? Is there, are there resources that people can read up on for age appropriate ways of communicating this information? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that um, I think typically does come up and something to remember is that not every adult exits a relationship at the same time or in the same way. And so that can that can make uh, talking to the children quite difficult because um, what one parent's narrative or story of what's going on in the relationship and the change that's going to happen in the family can differ a lot from the other parent's uh, story or perception of what's going on. And um, that can be or has the risk to be confusing for children, especially younger children um, who typically benefit from uh, simple or simplified um, and clear explanations of what's going on. So, so mm, sorry, it's a little bit difficult because one thing that I do get asked sometimes from parents is, you know, what should I say? What are the words? And that's very difficult because I, there are no perfect words. Um, <laughs> I, I've never found them anyway uh, to tell kids about something difficult or something awkward or, or something that is changing in their lives. Um, but there are some rules of thumb. Um, so one of the rules of thumb is to agree on what the narrative or the story will be prior to talking to the kids. Um, being able to identify like you said, age appropriate explanations, because again, what you're going to talk to say a 15 year old about is going to be very different than what you're going to talk to a five year old about. Um, something that I do typically talk to parents or, or um, uh, tell parents to look at as a way to figure out if what they're saying is age appropriate or not is to look at the types of books that their children are reading. And then to try to follow that storylines, um, word level, pacing, you know, those kinds of things. If your child is young and they're still reading picture books um, with one to two sentences per page, then really what you're going to try to do is you're try going to try to model that structure. Mm -hmm. If your child is older and they're reading chapter books that have complex uh, storylines or multiple storylines that are all kind of weaving together, there's a good chance that you can have a more in-depth conversation and you don't necessarily have to worry too much about um, those kinds of things. Um, one of the ways, uh, actually, it's a really nice little trick to see if um, the language that you're going to use is age appropriate is you can always type it into a Word document um, and then do, I think it's like if you do a word count, um, it will at the bottom give you a grade level score. Mm -hmm. And so if you, mm -hmm. if you type in your father and I are getting a separation 
and we are going to be dividing the matrimonial assets, say, <laughs> and you type that in there, there's a really good chance you're going to get a pretty high um, grade level score. Um, yeah, you just, you, in fact, you just lost me there. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so very clearly, you're not going to be um, having that type of conversation with anybody who is still in grade school at all. Um, but if you have a grade one or grade two level vocabulary that you've typed in there and your child is in that age range, you're probably doing OK. So, so. can we try some examples of like, um, OK, here's something to say. And then and then you can you can kind of grade that on like, oh, the likelihood of that being a good thing to say. <laughs> okay, what's the grade? What's the grade range? Am I doing like A, B, C, D? No, not the not the. Uh, well, sure, whatever way you want to rate it. So, uh, I'll give you one example, like um, where one where let's say the husband has been unfaithful, mm -hmm. uh, and then this would be this could be something that the wife would say to the children. Um, well, daddy's got a new girlfriend now. He he's decided to leave our family. Or something along those lines. Yeah. Um, what are the what are the uh, likelihoods of that being a good strategy? Um, probably fairly low. Um, but I'd like to pick apart that to explain why. Um, because again, I think um, for people to have understandings of why certain things um, would be more beneficial or less beneficial kind of helps guide their languages uh, or languaging. Part of me, because uh, especially with younger children you're going to have to talk to the kids multiple times. So there is no way of just saying that one thing and having the conversation be done. Um, so one of the one of the elements of what you said, Evan, um, is, you know, daddy has left our family. Um, and, and really that's very much a perspective from the marital relationship and not actually from the family relationship, right? Children don't divorce their parents. Um, and that's, that just doesn't happen. So from the child's perspective, their family actually has not changed in its components. It's only changed in its living structures. Um, one of the things and any client or, or I guess lawyer who has worked with me knows that I typically call uh, separated or divorced families to household families. Um, and that's done very purposefully because that's the child's reference. Mm -hmm. um, their family has not changed. Mom is still mom. Dad is still dad. Sister or brother is still sister or brother. It's just they happen to live in two households now instead of one. Um, and I commonly tell kids, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of unique. I have a four household family uh, just simply because, um, of course, myself and my siblings and my parents are all grown up now. And so we just happen to live in four separate households, mm. but they're still my family. And it's just kind of provides that a little bit of parallel or reference. Um, the other part is, is in regards to uh, introducing new family members, potentially, um, uh, you know, with your example, it's kind of nice that the mom didn't talk about the infidelity. Um, that's, that's kind of a good thing. Um, but also introducing well, that would be bad or, say, or, uh, <laughs> this is not. why the, you slept with someone that would be bad to get into those kinds of details. Absolutely. Um, and it goes back, essentially, all of those elements go back uh, to that intergenerational boundary. All of those events occurred within the marital relationship. And so therefore is adult content. Um, and so really what the main piece of information that any child, uh, d uh, no matter what their age, um, really needs to know about uh, changes in their family structure or if it, where parents are, where parents will be living, is that their relationships are still secure and stable. So um, something like your father and I have decided um, that we're not going to live in the same house anymore. We're going to do what's called a separation. Um, but I want you to know. Um, your dad still loves you very much, and so do I. And we're still going to be you know, your mom and dad, and that part will never change, right? Just redirect away from adult content and focus on what your child actually needs to hear, which is reassurance and messages of love and um, messages of stability, mm. which I understand can be very difficult for parents to do. 
um, especially when they're feeling overwhelmed, when they're emotionally hurting. Um, it is a very, very tall order, um, but very important at the same time. Sure. I, w- I was just thinking that like, even that language of leaving could be so scary for a child, right? They, they, that might bring up feelings for them. Like, well, what if he decides to leave me? What if I'm being left behind and those kinds of things? Um, Brandy, what if, um, like, you know, I've got, um, I get asked this quite often, um, or this comment, um, made to me is people will say, you know, I did some Google research and I think my ex is a narcissist. Um, no, you, you right? that from time to time, and there are narcissists out there. Um, but I think what they commonly are getting at is this person's very difficult to communicate with, um, that, you know, they maybe don't trust what's going on in the other home. And then I think what ends up happening in those situations is that parent is desperately trying to get information or communicate. And then that ends up leaching into conversations with the kids and that kind of thing. So, um, I know that's sort of a specific question in a way, but like, how, how do you, what would you suggest to that parent? Like what kind of supports can they get or what kind of things can they do on their side of the equation? If you've got no buy-in, from the other, (laughs) from the other half. Yeah. Um, you know what, it's, it's really interesting. Um, some of the things that I talk to children about a lot, um, are things that are inside their control and things that are outside of their control. Um, but that conversation parallels considerably um, to a lot of situations as adults, right? I mean, so just humans in general tend to become more frustrated, more overwhelmed, um, and have a lot harder time uh, managing and coping with things that are outside of their control. I think all you need to do is look at the state of the world right now and the pandemic that we're currently dealing with to know that that can be incredibly difficult because we have limited influence right? So typically what I talk to children about, uh, what I would talk to that parent about in particular, and what I have been talking to a lot of clients about in regards to the pandemic currently is search for what is in your control. Mm -hmm. Um, There are always things within our control. And if we can shift our focus, ask ourselves um, on a regular basis, what can I do in this moment? Not necessarily what can I do about my co-parent? What can I do about the fact that the children eat jelly beans and hot dogs at their place? Um, not what can I do about what the, the lawyer is going to say? Just what can I do in this moment? Um, because at the root of every situation, we all have the control over our own minds, over our own feelings, and over our own actions. And sometimes the thing that we can do is very small. Sometimes the thing that we can do is just close our eyes and take five deep breaths. Mm. But it will shift the situation. Um, it will shift that that person's ability to cope, that person's ability to think clearly. Like there is always something, but sometimes we have to search really hard for it. Sometimes it has to be small. So, so if there is the scenario where somebody is co-parenting with uh, somebody who is difficult, who has rigid communication styles or rigid thought patterns, who is um, kind of high conflict or focus a, focuses a lot of things on themselves, um, then it's what can you do in this situation, not what is your co-parent doing or not doing what can you do? Um, and hopefully that, that helps to create a little bit more feeling of control, a little bit more feeling of mastery or power in the situation and can open up some, some options. Um, there are also some, some really great resources in that area. One, um, one author in particular does some really amazing work when it comes to, uh, conflict communication, um, both in separation and divorce, but also just in general life and work scenarios as well. Um, and that person, his name is Bill Eddy. 
Um, and I got to give a shout out. He's Canadian as well, which is lovely. He's um, the best. <laughs> he is. And I can never remember if he was a lawyer first and then a social worker or a social worker first and then a lawyer. But it's kind yeah. of interesting that he has a foot in both camps because mm-hmm. um, I think that allows him to give a lot of really great information and great perspective on all of those different communication styles. So, so Bill Eddy um, is, is a great resource. I think it's... Um, Con- High Conflict Institute, I believe, is his yeah. website. But if you just Google Bill Eddy, you will definitely find him. Um, and he's got some really concrete, really action-oriented books that can help um, uh, anybody who is mm-hmm. struggling with communication with somebody else, not just uh, in a parent-to-parent situation. Yeah, he's got some pretty good sort of even one-pager resources, like the Biff response for emailing. Some, um, what's the other thing? I think you might have mentioned it um, in your in your notes. The what's your proposal yeah. approach to things? Um, just really helpful things that are like in that column, right? In the, in the, you, who you can control columns. So you're never going to be able to control the other side, but sometimes um, the things that you do can have effects on other people as well. Right. So. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things that he talks um, a lot about in, and I can't remember exactly which book, but um, that he does talk a lot about is that, that any kind of communication communication starts with you. Right. If if anybody is going into an interaction, but they're feeling stressed, they're feeling overwhelmed and their fight or flight response is turned on. It's just going to be way more difficult to to uh, think clearly, uh, make appropriate decisions. Um, it's very easy to be blindsided um, um, in difficult communication or or highly conflictual communication. Um, people tend to put out what I call like emotional hooks. So they're kind of like the red herrings of the conversation. So so maybe one parent emails another parent about pickup times for the children. They've got to change it from four to five or something like that. And then all of a sudden, everybody like takes a quick blink and they're they're frantically emailing back and forth about um, who the dog loves more or, you know, why did the vacation in Hawaii fall apart? And it's like, how did we get here? Um, It's that, you know, taking care of your own emotions, taking the slow and steady approach is going to help essentially avoid all of that additional uh, concern and conflict. Yeah. It's such, it's such good and poignant advice to uh, deal with stress. What, what you just said about focusing on our own circle of influence. Um, nothing causes us stress more, I think, than things we can't control and not being happy with how that's going. That's super stressful to me. Like if I start focusing on things I can't control and for example, sports. <laughs> sports produce such extreme emotions in people there's people in Europe uh, especially England are known for having these hooligan soccer fans that lose all control yes. they have riots they have big fights and stuff like this and it's all related to pinning so much emotion on something you have absolutely zero control over yeah. um, and I don't know why we love it but we love it <laughs> um, well it's I think- I- I, I thought you say, were able to control the outcome of a game depending on which sock you put on first. Isn't that? I thought you could. <laughs> Actually, I haven't tried that one yet, Heather. I'm going to try that one okay. tomorrow. Sorry, Brandy. <laughs> no, that's that's totally fine. But it but it is. It's it's a uh, it's um uh what is that called? The double edged sword, right? Is that anything that's emotionally engaging? is is going to be invested in by people right and and when we have our team and our team is doing something right that we have this um you know kind of perception that that we're part of that um and it stimulates things like pride and excitement and um you know happiness and and belonging and community and and all of those things are wonderful wonderful things 
when your team is doing well. <laughs> and, and then when they're not, uh, unfortunately, you get the, the other types of emotional engagements, um, which is, you know, anger and frustration and shame and blaming and, you know, all of those other things, which kind of takes um, a pretty sharp turn to the left sometimes. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's what we do. I don't know if you guys know about this, but Constantinople, back in the day, um, their big thing was chariot races, and there was four teams that were different colors. I think it was uh, red, green, blue. I don't know what the fourth color was. But they, uh, white, I think the fourth one was white. And they, like, that was how they identified, like, they, they, those different colored groups started wielding political power, and, the, like, they were mobocracies and stuff. And then you look at um, Montreal in the 50s when Rocket Richard was suspended right as he was about to take the scoring championship, which he never did, from Gordie Howe. And you look at Montreal in 1993 when they won the Stanley Cup, there was riots. And you look at Vancouver in 1994 when they lost, and then 2011 again when they also lost both riots in the city because of hockey. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, well, and, but, and we're not we're not immune to that either. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the year of it because I'm so sorry, Evan, but I'm not a huge sports fan. Um, okay. But I do recall one time trying to return to my apartment that was just off of uh, White Avenue. Um, one of the years that uh, the Oilers either won or lost. <laughs> I think it was the lost part of it. And, uh, and well, it, 2005 I or return. something when they, when they went all the way to the final, I believe that would have, I'll be honest, that timeline would have been probably exactly around that, mm -hmm. that I would, would have been living in the area. And, um, when I went to work the following day, <clears throat> excuse me, there were, you know, like bus enclosures smashed out and everything else over a, a hockey game. And, and Calgary, I think, was famous for a considerable amount of years for their red mile and, right. um, you know, what that, how that uh, city would react uh, versus, uh, for wins versus losses. So. And, and so to bring it back, uh, when you were talking about that, uh, it reminded me of, I, I, I love Stephen R. Covey and, and his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of the stories he shares in there is the story of Viktor Frankl. And Viktor Frankl, for anyone that doesn't know, um, I'm not going to go into all the details of the story, but he was in a Jewish concentration camp in World War II. And he just, as you know, he was at a low point, naked and beaten, um, he realized that there was one thing they couldn't take from him, and that was his mind. And he could control himself. And he made a decision then to, to choose to act instead of just to react. And he, he is a great story of hope and people around him lived longer and survived. And that power, he, it's just such a good extreme example of how when we focus on what we can control, then we can, our circle of influence actually ends up growing and we can have such great effects on the world and change the world. Whereas if we focus on things we can't control and become bitter and sour, then it, it shrinks and, and we lose influence. And so that applies certainly to, I think, to when a relationship is breaking down, we're going through difficult traumatic times in our life associated with that. Um, uh, especially like when you're losing influence over that person who is having such an influence over you in a negative way to kind of remember to, okay, let's just focus on, you know what I can control? I can control, we talked about stress of getting changed. I can control getting changed in the morning. I can control, you know, it starts small. And, and I think, uh, you know, I don't know, hopefully that can be helpful. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And I was going to say, if I can um, add on another um, and, and hopefully poignant um, lesson from, from Victor Frankl um, and his book, uh, you know, Man's Search for Meaning, um, is that he also, um, because he realized or within the realization that uh, his mind was still uniquely his own, um, he started to create uh, meaning. Why am I doing this? What is the purpose? What is my goal at the end of all this? Because absolutely, he could not control what was going on around him at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but he kept in his mind his desire to um, reconnect, I believe. Oh, it's been many years since I've read that book. 
but I believe it was with his wife. After everything was over, I'm going to reconnect with my wife. And um, that was the drive. That was the goal that kept him going. It was like kind of his carrot through throughout that entire experience, which I could only imagine being uh, incredibly, uh, incredibly difficult to, to, to live day to day. And so that's, that's very much the same, right, is that when um, families are going through change and there's a lot of uncertainty and what is this going to look like and how are things going to be decided and what can I do and are my kids going to be okay, right? Um, I talk to parents about, you know, at the end of the day, what do you want your children to remember? What do you want your life or their life to be like? Um, way, way, way beyond what's going on right now. And that can be, um, I talk to parents a lot of times needing a yardstick. Um, everybody needs their yardstick because in the moment where things are constantly shifting and there's so many different elements of change, it can be very easy to, you know, take a sharp right or a sharp left and, and later on not want to go down that path. So um, I, have a, I have a question when I'm first starting to interview parents, um, I have a question that I always tack on to the end. And I always say this comes with a little bit of a story. Um, I have an older sibling who um, who's married and at his wedding, there is a lot of speeches. <laughs> um, I love I love my brother very much. Uh, we're very different people sometimes, though. I had a very casual uh, kind of wedding and he had a very formalized wedding with lots of speeches. And I got to give this speech um, that I um, lovingly refer to as owed to my parents. Um, but it was essentially um, talking about, you know, what my parents have taught me, what I'll always remember them for, um, what I have valued about their parenting and, you know, kind of who they were to my siblings and I uh, growing up. And I always tell parents, think of that. Like, let's fast forward. One of your children is getting married and wants a really formal wedding with lots of speeches. And the other one is tasked with, with telling this. Like, what do you want to be in there? What do you want your children to remember and to say about your parenting and the joint parenting throughout their entire lives? And, and that's the yardstick because I've never had a parent come back and say, you know, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really matter to me whether they like their childhood or didn't like their childhood. Like I say, all parents want their kids to be happy and healthy and to be doing well. And, and that's got to be kept at the forefront of the brain. Yeah, including your ex. Yes, joint parenting. Oh, what yeah. do you want the parents to be remembered for? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, like, um, I meant what you're saying is all parents love their children. And mm -hmm. sometimes it, when we, um, I've seen my clients get to a place where they maybe start allowing themselves to think that's not true about the other parent. Oh, I see. Yes. But of course, of course it is true about the other parents. Mm -hmm. um, all parents love their children. They're trying to do their best, usually. Yeah. I love that um, story, Brandy, too, because I think it takes you to that 10,000 foot view as well of sort of thinking like, what's the big picture I'm aiming for here? Like, I'm a human. I'm going to misstep. I'm probably going to sometimes not say the right thing or, um, but generally speaking, what's the goal that I'm aiming for towards and, and like, and measuring yourself against that, um, so that there's, yeah, that big picture thinking. I, I really like that. I think that's quite lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a really great point, Heather, is that um, just like there's no perfect words, there are no perfect um, ways to be a parent. Um, a lot of times, um, and then I'll be honest, sometimes what, what ends up being a component of why the marriage is dissolving is uh, just uh, competing values, but it doesn't mean that the other person's values are not valid and not potentially beneficial. They just don't necessarily line up or the priority of them doesn't line up with, with maybe uh, with the other parents. Um, meaning, um, uh, you know, the opposites attract, um, very common. It can be very common to have one parent value, um, spontaneity and being in the moment and going with the flow and taking what life gives you. 
and the other parent to value uh, structure and routine and expectations and consistency. In reality, children benefit from both of those things when right. they're done in balance. Right. But absolutely, I can understand and I can see how over time parents become more and more polarized and they try to compensate for the other parent by becoming more <laughs> structured and routine and more spontaneously as spontaneous and in the moment. And um, and unfortunately, it's the polarization that can can have a negative effect on children, whereas exactly that, if you can remember, like all of this can benefit our children that that hopefully a, a balance can be struck in some way hmm. uh, uh, sorry i was gonna say i have people who reach out to me quite often and they say well my kid is going to therapy or my spouse is my ex is going to take them to therapy i don't know what's happening there how do i get involved and i was curious more on the operational side of things <laughs> what is the process look like for both parents being involved in that that therapy and and what is therapy for little kids yeah um so yeah so, okay so that's that's a large question so i'm going to just break it down a little bit is that typically um the therapy itself uh looks different based on the age and developmental stage of the child uh so typically children who are you know kind of under 12 there's there's um usually some elements of play um, there are some elements of activity-based uh, interventions um, because, as all parents are aware, if you try to sit your young child down and have an hour-long conversation with them, you will lose them after 10 minutes and nothing gets in. So, so there are different um, therapeutic, um, you know, kind of orientations and trainings and what have you to, in order to work with young children. But, but usually it's activity based with really young children. Um, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it, it tends to be fully activity based or, or heavily activity based. Um, and then, you know, you kind of start to get into more talk based therapies and talk therapies, um, you know, children hit teenage uh, years and what have you. So that's what typically people would think of when you think of therapy, they think of sitting on a couch and talking with somebody, but um, that's more so adult types of therapy and, um, and maybe teenagers. So, so yeah, so there is a wide range of things. Um, my office, um, I think you can see a little bit of my bookshelf in the, in the video here, um, but my office is also a playroom. And so, you know, there are lots of different things in there to be creative with and toys to play with and explore with and, and whatnot. And that's, that's typical of anyone who works with young children. Um, now, in terms of operations, um, there are some hard and fast rules of what is required uh, of me because I'm a registered psychologist, um, but then there's also uh, typically what um, uh, like what I have adopted into my practice. So of course, anytime you work with a minor, you do need um, to have parental consent. Um, one of the things that I have incorporated into my practice uh, through experience and best practice kind of thought process is um, I have joint um, parental consent uh, of any family that is a two household family. And that means meeting with both parents, talking um, together with all all of the adults so you know all the emails that I send I send to both parents and I get parents to send me information copying both you know copying the other parent uh, essentially so that everybody can have an awareness of what's going on and an understanding um, I find that this is incredibly helpful, especially with younger children, because um, if we're talking about any kind of strategies that they need to use at home or things that they need to practice, um, I really do need that parental support to cue them and to remind them um, and to help you know, help them do anything like that at home. Um, so I think it's really important. Um, but one of the other things, especially with, like I say, registered psychologists, which is what I can speak to because that's my background, is that all guardians of uh, a child receiving therapy services from a registered psychologist d does have what we call right to access to information. 
Um, and so if, uh, you know, if you have a situation like that, or if anybody is telling you, um, yeah, they're going to see this psychologist, but I don't know what's going on and or I can't get any information, um, then I would say, tell them to keep trying, um, either with the therapist or the, pardon me, the psychologist directly, um, or to contact, um, because we're registered professionals, you can contact the, um, our college as well to see what, what, um, um, the obligations of the psychologist are um, because, yeah, parents um, typically do want to know what's going on with their child uh, in therapy and, and how they can help and, and what kind of important pieces of information they need to know. Actually, what kind of um, information could a parent expect to be getting from you about what's going on in therapy? Like, are you, if you have that situ like that example that I used before where your other uh, spouse isn't, your ex-spouse isn't communicating well with you, can you expect after a few sessions, Brandy's going to call you up and say, yeah, no, he's really being a jerk. So um, I confirm <laughs> that through the kid and he should get less time. Like, uh, it, it, what kind of reporting are you getting from? Um, working with the child. <laughs> I'm being a little yes. facetious there. I appreciate Absolutely. it. I was, but... <laughs> I was like, um, those are the clinical terms, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, to be clear, that is what some clients definitely are hoping to get back. <laughs> Yes, absolutely, and and that is a lot of the education that I do to parent or do with parents about the limitations of my role. Because absolutely, depending on what, uh, who exactly I'm working with, I can provide different levels or different types of feedback. Um, if I'm working individually with a child, I can give feedback about that child. Um, it, one of the kind of uh, really strong and hard rules uh, when working with, um, you know, uh, therapists is, is we really can only give feedback in regards to people who we have worked with directly. Um, there are also some pretty hard and fast rules about um, specifically recommendations or opinions or feedback about parenting time. There is one... Um, one situation, essentially, uh, because parenting time, um, parenting responsibilities and whatnot is such a significant area to comment on. Um, it is only when something called a bilateral custody assessment um, has been completed. Sorry, Brandon, can you say that again? Lottery kind of, kind of got quiet there. Bilateral. Okay. A bilateral custody assessment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so if you are assessing specifically custody or what is now very much called parenting time, mm -hmm. um, then you can comment on it. Um, but really, other than that, you, you cannot. Um, even with other types of court ordered interventions uh, and what have you, that's still very, uh, that's, that's not um, appropriate uh, to do. Um, so that's why there's lots of other types of assessments and interventions. Um, so in, in my practice, um, I do um, not necessarily related to situations of separation and divorce, uh, but I do psychoeducational assessments. And so in those ways, because I have done the specific um, information gathering about uh, a child's state of mind and how they're doing in school, um, their cognition, I can talk about it. Um, but uh, if I was seeing a child for therapy, for example, I couldn't necessarily talk about um, their cognition because I just wouldn't have that information. So it's, you know, it's that whole idea is that, yeah, if I'm working individually with a child, I really cannot comment on um, a parent as a person, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, but potentially I could comment on um, the child's interpretations or impact of certain situations on the child, those kinds of things. But it's always done from the reference point of, of my client. And mm -hmm. If my client is the child, that's got to be the reference point. Mm -hmm. If I'm working with both parents or if I'm working with an entire family together, um, then I can speak a little bit more so to the interactional patterns or impact of one person to another person um, because I'm actually engaged and gathering information and have an ability to assess um, 
all of those different elements. Um, but that's really impossible when you have one, one solitary client. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, that, I think that's really um, that's really helpful and and good information to know. <clears throat> I've I've got a hard a hard question. So people oh so a lot of psychology is paid out of pocket. So group mm-hmm. benefits plans rarely cover um, what is needed uh, to help people out. So there's people out there who who know that their kids need help. They they know that they want to find somebody just like you, but they don't have the money to do it. Um, so my first question is how did they find help? And the second question is what could they expect for costs? Are kids, is there, is their therapy any cheaper than what it would cost for an adult? Um, yes, there definitely are. Um, and just sometimes uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Kim. I mean, unfortunately, uh, sometimes it is what we call like a buyer beware situation. Um, and so there are definitely agencies that out, that are out there that provide therapy services that have some sort of a subsidized cost. Um, so they'll either offer a sliding fee scale, um, or they will have, um, uh, some additional funding that doesn't come directly from a client. Uh, so places like uh, the Family Center, Catholic Social Services, they are also funded through uh, their charitable organizations, and so they can provide services at a much lower cost. Um, but I would encourage people to ask whichever therapist, um, whether you know if they're a registered psychologist or a registered social worker, or clinical social worker, or whichever, um, ask them about their background and their training. Um, it uh, sometimes, uh, I've gotten the feedback, it can sometimes be a little bit awkward to say like, well, what are your areas of expertise and how long have you been practicing and do you work with situations that are similar to ours? Um, but it is absolutely appropriate. Um, and whichever therapist that you are engaging should be able to answer all of those questions. Mm. Um, not, uh, no one can be the perfect therapist for everybody. And we all have our areas that we typically work in or our limitations. And it's up, it's up to, to um, uh, you know, jointly between the, the therapist and the client to make sure that things are a good fit. Um, if a child is not comfortable with that individual, if it feels like they maybe don't have as much experience that's kind of needed for the situation, um, then, then it's absolutely appropriate to kind of shop around and to, to call a few different people. Um, having said that, um, specifically for separation and divorce, there are some um, additional resources that are out there. Unfortunately, right now with COVID and what have you are somewhat limited, um, but there are actually um, groups for children that um, that can that have been running um, to various degrees. Uh, like I say, I think right now it's a little bit difficult because I don't know how many of them have moved online. Um, but that can be a, also a really wonderful way to get your children support um, and have it be cost effective. Um, so one of the groups that I'm familiar with, um, which is kind of like a, an oldie but a goodie, um, is the, the Rainbows program. Uh, um, the Rainbows program, yeah, it looks at it's a it's a grief and loss program. Um, so sometimes there are children in that uh, in those groups that uh, their parents are not necessarily uh, going through a divorce, um, but they are uh, somebody has passed away. Um, or something like that. Um, but because separation and divorce is, is addressed a lot of times with children in a similar framework, the grief and losses, um, they, it does work. It does work well together. So um, those are pretty site specific um, in terms of whether or not they've, turned, they've gone online or, or if they've kind of like halted in this moment uh, due to COVID restrictions. Um, but that's something that exists out there for sure. Um, there's also a group that, um, that, uh, I recently with a, with a colleague of mine, um, ran a group with, I say recently, but this is pre-COVID, um, <laughs> um, and it's called the CODIP, uh, group. 
And uh, so that is something actually that is that is specific for children um, who are going through separation and divorce. So um, it is unique to to that group. And it looks at uh, building up skills um, of resiliency uh, for children that are that are um, experiencing separation and divorce. So, um, yeah, so th so there are resources out there in a group format. Uh, and typically the, the group format can um, uh, support a reduced cost because then, uh, of course, it's um, the, the time and the resources and the energies that all need to go into that is, is kind of dispersed amongst um, the participants. So what is the cost for a, a registered psychologist specializing with children? Like a range? Is there a range? Because people, will, our listeners will want to know so they can put yeah. it in a budget. Yeah, absolutely. So, so there's a couple different ways. Um, and again, it's, it's a little bit different when it comes to private practice, um, because, uh, businesses are able to set their own rates. So I'm going to speak very generally, but I would also absolutely encourage listeners to, to call around and to ask what, what different agencies rates are. Um, but we have, um, uh, what's called the PAA, the psychologist, um, uh, Association of uh, Alberta, and they put out recommended rates for therapy services and, and uh, things like that. So, so if um, if it's general therapy uh, for for a child, um, the PAA recommended rate right now is is two hundred dollars um, per session or per hour. Um, now, again, some agencies will just have a sliding fee scale. Uh, my agency for general therapy does um, offer a sliding fee scale. So a part of our intake process is to ask um, what the household income is to determine that fee. Um, but we also have certain specific areas that are considered specialized. Um, so not necessarily all the time when we're working with uh, children directly, but if we're working with a family who is going through a specific divorce process, like a collaborative family law process or, or something like that, we do have an elevated rate. Um, and that, uh, that at this point is uh, $275 per session. Um, and then we do have a, uh, what we call a psycholegal fee. Um, and so if there does need to be a quite a formalized process um, that is, um, you know, has court involvement and court orders and, and what have you, then there is a specific rate for that as well, which is $370 or $350 pending per, per hour. Um, so really what it is, is that's that early intervention, that ability to keep the conflict down, to stay out of formalized uh, processes um, uh, within the, the, uh, or the legal system, then um, usually the, the lower cost that there is. Um, mm -hmm. Do you work with benefits providers? I know Kimmy mentioned, you did mention that some benefit plans do cover some costs for counseling and therapy. Uh, somewhat. So um, meaning that, so a registered psychologist um, would always be recognized by benefit plans as long as there's something in there that we, like a portion of that, that we would be covered by. So in benefit plans in Alberta, um, psychologists are covered by anything that identifies as psychological services as well as anything that identifies as um, health spending accounts, as well as anything that's identified as wellness spending accounts. So if somebody, so definitely it's really important for people to get to know their policy and get to know their benefits plan. Um, because if I, any or all three of those are included in somebody's uh, extended health care benefits, then that's what um, a psychologist can be claimed under. Um, now, there are also a lot of uh, social workers and clinical social workers that work in this area. And that can be a little bit more um, um, variable from plan to plan. So again, double check your benefits plan to see. A lot of agencies do direct bill um, so that uh, clients aren't necessarily paying out of pocket each time. Um, 
it, usually, you know, it's gonna, you can use up your benefits and then have a fee after that. Right. But the other piece of information that sometimes people are not aware of is that um, uh, for social workers as well as for uh, registered psychologists, uh, we are what's considered medical expenses underneath people's tax um, uh, tax preparation or, or tax situation. So um, if there's uh, the need for especially intensive or long-lasting um, therapeutic services, um, we always tell people, save your receipts um, and then apply them on your taxes come um, April. Mm. And then, um, depending on the situation, depending on all of the, the nitty gritties with that, uh, sometimes it can make um, a bit of difference as well. Right. Get you over that minimum amount that you need to claim or, or add to it. Great. Those are all super, super tips to make that a little more financially accessible for folks. Yeah. Yeah, and I do think that is um, definitely a difficult uh, thing for people is, um, you know, um, psychology being how it is. Um, benefit plans can can differ vastly. So, so unfortunately, I have had some clients come in and they have maybe enough for one or two sessions under their benefit plans. Um, yeah. And I have other people that um, their benefit plans are significant and they're able to pay pretty much most of it through there and, and have very little coming out of their own pocket. Mm -hmm. um, so, so one of the pieces, and then this is going to be absolutely a little bit of just general psychology uh, soapbox, um, standing. Um, but it's really important for people to advocate with their employers as well. Um, mental health and, and good mental health is something that um, um, we're talking more and more about these days, um, but sometimes isn't still translating into resources. And so if people look at their benefit plans and are noticing that really there's not a lot in there in terms of uh, mental health supports and other medical needs that employees have, then the idea is to, you know, talk with your employer, talk with, you know, whoever's in HR and when that benefit plan can be renegotiated um, to make Make sure that that's highlighted that that's something that's um that is needed and needs to be advocated for because um it can be developed and it can be part of of uh extended health care plans um but i think it's it's one of those situations unfortunately you don't know that you need it until you need it uh -huh. and then um you have to deal with with what you have yeah 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 and then you realize yeah it's not there or it's limited for sure yeah don't get me started about insurance that's companies easy. <laughs> Fair enough. I learned some pretty shocking things on our last episode about insurance. So I don't, <laughs> I don't remember oh. any for another insurance conversation this week. <laughs> Randy makes a good point though. Like on, I sell group benefits. It's part of my offering with people and educating, having a good group benefits person as your advocate is is really important for a company because they'll educate the employers on what other people are doing and what their options are and a lot of small businesses don't know what questions to ask so mm -hmm. um, you know if employees are going to the boss and saying hey i need this stuff the, the boss will note that for their renewal and they can talk mm -hmm. about it with their group benefits provider maybe think about adding it adding it in and, and taking other things off the list that aren't as used. So I think that's a, a great point. Maybe one day we'll have a group benefits person, a specialist on our program to talk a little bit how to maneuver that and add, add psychology to that. To that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, anybody, if we, any of our listeners out there own a small business and, and they employ people and they have a corporation, just get a private health services plan. Uh, I don't know if you deal with that at all, Kim, but it, that allows you just to have an amount and, then, and your employees can use it for whatever services they want. They can use it towards orthodontry. They can use it towards whatever. And then once it's used up, it's used up. So that you can set it to be $1,000 or $2,000. Premiums for insurance companies are crazy. Um, they, usually it's in the range of 170 to 300 dollars per month both the employee and the employer's portion so if you just put five to seven hundred dollars a month towards a private health services plan the person there's so much more opportunity to get to get value out of that yeah. and premiums don't go up 
the, the, the tough thing is that there's no one size fits all for every employer. Oh, that's it. I just said that's the size that fits all, Kim. <laughs> I, I like your thinking, Evan, but unfortunately, there are other elements that uh, fine that not to be the case always. <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Brandy, it has been a pleasure having you on here, uh, getting to know you, and 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 um, sharing in your vast wealth of knowledge. We really appreciate it, and it certainly, as lawyers, we often uh, I, I'm I feel confident saying Heather does this as well let people know that um, I'm, a, I'm expensive and not a very good psychologist. So your money is better spent <laughs> going to see Brandy about those types of issues than me. Uh, I can help you with the law. That's, that's it. Yeah. So hearing from you is, uh, is great. And, and you offer a service that certainly um, I think everybody who's going through a divorce, divorce is such a traumatic experience. Everybody going through that should be looking for other resources to help them as well, um, mm -hmm. like yourself, than yeah. just lawyers, because lawyers, you know, we're good for some things, not everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. No. And I can, I can appreciate that for sure. There's, um, there's been definitely more than one time in conversations that I will utter the phrase, that sounds like a legal question. I'm not the person to ask that question to. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I guess it's one of those uh, things if I can, you know, kind of um, just going up based on what you just said, um, add a little bit for the listeners is that I think, unfortunately, um, there are a lot of moments where people are looking for therapeutic kind of outcomes, healing, um, emotional kind of uh, goals to be met in the in the wrong system. Um, I see this uh, clients who are seeking that within the criminal justice system, as well as with, you know, within family law as well. And unfortunately, um, it's just the wrong system uh, to, to meet that need. And so, yeah, there needs to be something else in order to get that outcome. Uh -huh. Yeah, every tool has their place. You can't just use a sledgehammer for everything. A sledgehammer does not make a great paintbrush, for example. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Kim, do you have any closing thoughts? No, this is really great. Brandy, I appreciate how much, how generous you were with the information you shared. I had a series of questions and you just kind of kept knocking them off as you <laughs> went through. And I know there's, you know, the most important pe person in many people's lives are their kids. And I think people are going to be really interested to hear what you had to say today. So thank you for your time. Yeah, and we should just restate my comments uh, about insurance are my opinion, not Kim's. <laughs> uh, Kim has very strict uh, compliance that she's got to follow in, so we just want to make that disclaimer very clear. <laughs> uh, and Kim, yeah, Kim can definitely uh, analyze your situation and let you know what the best option might be for you and your business. <laughs> heard my opinion, but I'm not a financial advisor, so <laughs> maybe, maybe take it with a grain of salt. Heather, any, any uh, close? thoughts from you oh just thanks so much for your time and generosity brandy it's always a pleasure you always have some interesting uh really interesting nuggets that that stick with me and um yeah go read man search for meaning it's so so good it's one of the books i go back to probably once every once a year or once every two years it's uh it's amazing Awesome. Well, yeah. thank, thanks again, Brandy. And thank, thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in to uh, this episode of Access to Justice. And we'll see you next time. See you next time. Any information in this video is general information only and is not, nor is it intended to be, legal advice. Watching this video does not create a lawyer-client relationship. You should always seek the advice of a lawyer or other qualified professional for advice regarding your individual situation. While we take care to ensure that the information contained in this video is accurate and up-to-date, we make no warranties or representations as to the suitability, completeness, or accuracy of the information contained in this video. Any reliance you place on the information is at your own risk. Kahane Law Office, Merrick Law, Heather Mallory Professional Corporation, Evan Clark Professional Corporation, Evan Clark, Heather Mallory, and any guests will not be responsible nor liable in any way for any content, including but not limited to any errors or omissions in the content, or for any loss or damage of any kind incurred as a result of any content communicated in this video, whether by Evan Clark, Heather Mallory, or by a third party. Kim McDonald is a financial advisor with Raymond James Limited. Information provided is not a solicitation, and although obtained from sources considered reliable, is not guaranteed. The view and opinions contained in this media are those of Kim McDonald, not Raymond James Limited. 
Securities related products and services are offered through Raymond James Limited, member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Insurance products and services are offered through Raymond James Financial Planning Limited, which is not a member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Raymond James advisors are not tax advisors, and we recommend that clients seek independent advice from a professional advisor on tax related matters. Insurance products and services are offered through Raymond James Financial Planning Limited, RJFP, a subsidiary of Raymond James Limited, which is not a member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. When providing life insurance products, financial advisors are acting as insurance representatives of RJFP. Darkness of the dales dissipates, declines because of he who turned water.